All right, welcome to Liquid Lunch. We're coming at you live. It's May 6th, and Daniel Katz is joining me here on yes, the show. Yes, I'm here, hopefully Dan. in body and soul. Nice <laughs> to see you. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's really... See, I, this is why I wanted you to come on the show today, uh -huh. Dan, because I didn't know yeah. that you uh, were familiar with some of the work of Ayn Rand. No, I didn't know, and I, I did some yoga and did some meditation so I can bring my body and my soul to this interview. And uh, hopefully, well, yeah, you know. well, because uh, we should get right into it, because yeah. we have uh, Dr. Yaron yeah. Brook here uh, all the way from uh, Southern California yeah. in town to give a talk at the U of T uh, tonight on the morality of capitalism, and of course he has the book here, The uh, Free Market Revolution, uh, How Ayn Rand's Ideas Can End Big Government. So. Welcome, Dr. Thank you. Brooke. Great to have you here. Thanks for having me. And I'm uh, really looking forward to this conversation. So, uh, you know, we were sort of talking before the show, and uh, I, I, I said that um, that I thought that Ayn Rand's ideas were partly responsible for the neo-con revolution that I yeah. guess started around the Margaret Thatcher, uh, Reagan, and uh, Brian Mulroney days. But you're saying uh, my premise is totally wrong. Well, I'm saying your premise is wrong for many reasons. I, I don't consider Margaret Thatcher or Ronald Reagan neocons. I, I mean, again, let's, let's be precise about what we mean by neocons. Yeah, Neoconservatives no are liberals who became conservative during the 19, late 1960s and early 1970s. The, the first neocon was Irving Kristol, and he was a Trotskyite. And he was a Trotskyite, then he was an anti-Soviet socialist. And then he moderated mm -hmm. a little bit more to the right, all the, way over there. all the way to becoming a conservative. But he never gave up his liberal, his, his leftist ideology. He believed that the best way to achieve leftist goals mm -hmm. was by adapting government to more conservative means. But he was never, he, he, I mean, indeed, he, he, he hated Ayn Rand. He was very antagonistic to Ayn Rand because Ayn Rand never bought into any of the leftist ideals. I didn't believe that the purpose of society was to attain some kind of leftist utopia. Mm -hmm. She starts with the individual. She has no sense of society and collectivism as a goal, as a, mm -hmm. a, and, and the individual as a means to an end. But the neocons, the neocons believe that individuals are means to ends. The, the neocons are collectivists. They're statists. They just, you know, they're more conservative than typical leftist statists. But they're still statists. They still want to use government to attain social goals, to attain social means. This is why they have the foreign policy that they do, right? They want to use government to go out into the world and bring democracy to the world. That's not an Ayn Rand perspective. Ayn Rand would never advocate for that. Oh. So, so it's very much they want to make the welfare state more efficient. Mm -hmm. They're not about abolishing the welfare state, which is an Ayn Rand position, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, therefore, using the rich to suck as much tax money out of them in order to redistribute it, so you lower taxes, supply-side economics, right? You lower taxes to get more money out of the rich. Okay. Ayn Rand says, no, the money is the rich. You want to lower taxes on them because it's theirs. It's not your money. Don't stop stealing it from them. Yeah. It has nothing to do with these social, uh, social programs. So the neocons are the enemies of objectivism, and indeed, they view it that way. If you actually talk to a real neocon, you know, the Crystals, Bill, uh, you know, Bill Crystal, who's on TV a lot in the mm -hmm. United States, or... Michael Novak or, or, or Irving Crystal, who died a few years ago, they would have said, we have nothing to do with Ayn Rand. Okay, so uh, I like uh, the terms you're using, collectivist versus uh, individualist. Um, and it seems that a lot of people are trying to put their finger on what's wrong with America yeah. these days. And uh, a lot of them, or the ones that I'm hearing that I like, the ones I listen, they're saying the real problem is collectivism. And it's essentially, I mean, you could call it communism, uh, which is a, a, seems a little out of date yeah. to blame it on communists sure. these days. Sure. But they're, they're saying it's this collectivism that's the real problem. But there, it seems people are having a hard time really articulating that, getting that idea across, and coming up with a real solution. See, there are lots of forms of collectivism. Uh, communism is one. It's a, it's a, it's a radical form of... Uh, you know, socialism, but it's, it's just one form of collectivism. Fascism is a form of collectivism. Uh, multiculturalism, in my view, is a form of collectivism. Any kind of racism is a form of collectivism. Any time you place the group ahead of the individual, any time your standard is the group, your standard is society, your standard is mm -hmm. something other than the well-being of the individual, then it's a form of collectivism. And again, we have lots of forms of collectivism only one true form of individualism. Well, what's it, just from either one of you, actually, yeah. <laughs> my own nose here, what is collectivism? Let's get that Collectivism the is the idea that the group is primary. 
Oh, so that, 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 that the said. individual serves the group, that the purpose of your life is to serve your tribe or your group mm -hmm. or your, you know, uh, uh, some collective out there, right. the state, right? right the right. state, uh, any, any kind of statism mm -hmm. where the state is primary. Uh, uh, what did, uh, you, know, uh, you know, John McCain say, country first. Right. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. collectivism. That's the country mm -hmm. first. You're, mm -hmm. you're nothing. You're just a cog in the machine to serve, to yeah. serve the state. Now, he's uh, a Republican senator. Well, Republicans are just as collectivist oh, as Democrats. Because you just said fascism also. Okay. So, uh, well, I think, I think just, to, just to be clear, I think Democrats are far more fascist than Republicans. But, but oh, okay. Absolutely. Okay. The left. Uh, but the they left, smile a lot. The left is the primary <laughs> fascist movement today in the world. Uh -huh. And and if you if you you know the the left is far more collectivistic than the right. Now the right has problems. I'm not I'm not going to and I just mentioned one yeah. in the, in the name of McCain. But um, you know fascism is not right versus left. What's the difference between fascism and communism? Well, What's the difference? They're both the same. Well, they're you There's know what? I'm not private sure, corporations. I, you know. So the difference is this. The difference is that the communism. The state owns the means of production, yeah. right? It right. owns the factories. Right. Okay. In fascism, the state controls the means of production. They mm -hmm. they get, leave you the pretense of private property. Mm -hmm. You oh. own it, but they control it. So under Mussolini or Hitler, did anybody really own their own factories? Could they decide what price to charge and what products to make? No. The yeah. state told them, but right. they pretended like they were private. But the fundamental for both is that you as an individual don't matter. You as an individual live for the proletarian under communism, you live for the state under fascism or for the uh, race under fascism or for some other you know, statist goal. But th there's no difference between the two. The two are both ultimately on, on, on the left side of the spectrum. They're both big government welfare. It's no accident that the Nazi party was the National Socialist Party. They were socialist. They believe in you know, sacrificing the, the able, the wealthy, the people who create stuff for the rest of the people, for, for everybody else. Massive redistribution of wealth, control over the means of production. So there's fundamentally no difference between fascism and communism, and they both belong on the left side of the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. So what, what's, I mean, what's happening today? There are people out there that are saying that there's been uh, even a conspiracy I'll use that word, the C word, <laughs> a conspiracy to kind of uh, change even the educational system so that it really puts forward a collectivist kind of eth ethos. Well, look, this isn't a conspiracy. This is just straight philosophy. Uh, American educational system, and I don't know about the Canadian, but America, I know. The American, Canadian, uh, the American educational system is strongly influenced by John Dewey, the American philosopher of the late 19th century. And John Dewey, uh, in, in, you know, came up with the idea of progressive education. Mm -hmm. And the goal of progressive education is not to teach you anything. It's not knowledge. The goal of progressive education is to socialize you. Mm -hmm. It's to make you part of the group. It's to make you part of the collective. So there's no doubt in my mind that over the last hundred years, the educational system in the United States has driven students towards collectivism and away from individualism, towards uh, reliance on the state and on other people and away from self-reliance and self-responsibility and, and, and uh, you know, the pursuit of one's own happiness and own success on one's own terms. The state in the United States, through the educational system, has moved us away from the founding fathers' vision of individualism and the 19th century vision of pioneers and individualists out there struggling and making making you know, life for themselves into a collectivized group think, don't stand out, um, work for the group and work for the state. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like there could be some convoluted mess in all this, in that uh, someone going into, um, I want to uh, uh, um, address neo uh, the neocon also situation, but sure. that people going through MBA schools, whatever school is, now, some yeah. are very, advance and they really do there are some bright lights amongst the professors that really want to share your view without even picking up this book sure. but I, I I can't help but thinking that a lot of them are trained to be high-end um, um, you know paper pushers like they just to fit into the mold somewhere in some slot uh, and know how to say yes sir so, and work so I, their way up the corporate no, ladder. there's no question I mean I used to I used to teach uh, I'm a 
finance professor by, uh, by training. Oh, okay. So I used to teach in a business school. I used to teach in an MBA program and an undergraduate business program. And look, most of the professors are either, you know, do things this way because it's always been done. Yeah. But a lot of them are on the political spectrum leftists. Uh, you know, when you survey business schools in the United States, ask people for their political affiliation, uh, over 70 percent of left of, are left of center. So business that, schools... That doesn't go away from what I just said. No, I, I, absolutely yeah, quite the yeah, contrary. Yeah. So they, they're much more about kind of the cronyism. They're much more about regulation and state intervention and state control than they are about entrepreneurship and about building a business and about being creative and by, about, you know, making something of your own life. Uh, so, yes, business schools today do not help train individuals to be the kind of business leaders that I think you know, capitalism demands. The capitalism well, you're caught in this want. dilemma, how to play the game. I have a brother-in-law who's in the middle of it, and he's actually an outcast secretly, but he's there, and he knows his stuff in um, business systems management, so he, they're not going to get rid of him quite yet. But uh, you just know how to play the game to keep your job and move up that next slot, and then you get caught in a, a well, whole look, other thing. Look, but that good, may not business. Good I'm not blaming it on business school. I'm yeah, not blaming it on business and school. good businesses don't encourage that, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, businesses who are successful encourage their employees to be entrepreneurial, to be creative, to be, uh, to come up with new ideas and to be independent and to think for themselves. It is, you find this kind of mentality, the bureaucratic mentality, yes. Yes. much more in businesses that are in, in, in hand in hand with government that maybe don't have that much competition or not involved in in real innovation and all that are just dying, right? I mean, there's a cycle in business. Mm -hmm. uh, the entrepreneurial, the, 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 the businesses that are really thinking forward, the businesses that allow the employees to think for themselves, are the businesses that break through, the businesses that innovate, that are businesses that are moving forward. Other businesses are dying because they don't allow that. See, in a truly competitive market, which unfortunately we don't have today, yeah. you get a very dynamic situation where success is driven by people's ability to think for themselves and be creative and be an entrepreneur. I have nothing against what you just said. I, I'm actually hopefully for that part of it. Uh, I'm just saying that unfortunately there exists, there's this gray area between just for the state. It just depends which but crazy boss you have or group yeah, of bosses. Yeah, but this is encouraged by the political system we okay. have both in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, what, you know, to, to really get capitalism, or what this book is really about, is what we need is a state to back off of business, to get mm. out of the job of business. So, you know, I'm an advocate for no regulations, mm. for, for, for the government to separate itself from the, from the world of business. Let business compete, let business succeed or fail, let companies go bankrupt if they fail, let them make a gazillion dollars if they're successful, get government out of the business of business. But when you have businessmen who have to make nice with bureaucrats, regulators, politicians, then they become bureaucrats, regulators, they become politicians, and that's the mentality they get. And that destroys innovation and progress and success. So what you want, in my worldview, is what you want is a separation of business from government. I would think that uh, you know, the idea of the military-industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us all about is really uh, a big part of the problem, because all that government money is being spent on private sector companies for all this military stuff, and, and they have to cozy up to See, the I don't, I don't think that the real problem is, is the military complex. I think it's the industrial complex. I think the problem today is that there's almost no industry in the United States today that doesn't get some kind of subsidies, some kind of tax breaks, supposedly, trying to manipulate their behavior. Uh, there's no business in America that doesn't have to deal with regulators, with antitrust people, with some element within government. That, it, that dominates them and, and restricts their ability to, to be productive and to be, and to be creative. Yeah, I mean, you've got, you've got more of that in the military part of it. But look, government needs a military. It's just a question of how big it needs to be. And whether it's, it's today, it's much more than the military. It's spread over all these industries, and government has its hand in almost every side of the U.S. economy. So, oh. Go ahead. Well, I have to ask this, Dan. Yeah. Okay, so uh, <laughs> if the answer is, is uh, less regulation, now some people are saying they're looking at the big uh, economic crash of 2008 and they're saying part of the problem was that uh, of de the deregulation that began under Reagan and got to the point where these companies, these banks were left unregulated yeah. and they, yeah. they 
they ruined the game. So this is, this is one of the most bizarre ideas I've ever heard of, right? Because if you know anything about banking in the United States, you realize that even during the 2000s, it was the most regulated industry in the United States. There's not a bank in the United States that is not regulated by at least five different entities. Five different ones. The government is everywhere in banks. There's not a product a bank can offer that the government doesn't have to approve. Mm -hmm. There's not an activity it engages it that some bureaucrat doesn't have to say, okay. They're too big to fail. So government has, you know, do whatever you want. Make as much profit as you want. If you fail, we'll bail you out. Mm -hmm. That's deregulation. There's, mm -hmm. been, there's been minor, insignificant deregulation of the banking sector since the Reagan era to today. There's been almost none. Uh, and it, the, you cannot show any relationship, any, and I've challenged people in debates about this topic, show me one relationship between a deregulation and the financial crisis. There's zero relationship. So this is a myth, complete myth. What happened is too much regulations. What happened is that the regulation of the banking sector incentivized banks towards behavior that was irresponsible, that, that put them and their clients in financial risk, and they created the bubble that we saw in 2008. And what was that? What were those things? One, the Federal Reserve in the United States kept interest rates at below the rate of inflation. That's called the negative real rate of return, like they are right now. Right? When you do that, you incentivize people to do what? You incentivize people to take on debt. Mm -hmm. Guess what people did? Guess what people are doing right now in Canada? Mm -hmm. Because interest rates are so low. They're taking on debt. Mm -hmm. Because money is so cheap, right. I'd be an idiot not to take on a loan. So, so this is where they're forced or they're enticed to, to they're do crazy in, things. They're enticed to do crazy things. And then why did it all go into housing? Because in America, government subsidizes housing on a massive scale. That's Freddie that's and that's Fannie, government saying. entities, uh -huh. are subsidizing mortgages and telling you, oh, no, you should buy a house. Both uh, Bill Clinton and George Bush uh, set as a goal that 70% of Americans should own a house. At the time, it was somewhere between 60 and 63%. And they were driving towards 70 so they said, we're going to subsidize housing until 70% of Americans own a house. Mm -hmm. So guess what? They, they lowered those mortgage rates by, by uh, Freddie and Fannie buying up those mm -hmm. mortgages and driving rates down. And all the debt that Freddie and Fannie was, were taking on in order to do this was guaranteed by the U.S. government. So, of course, it was really cheap debt. And, if, and we know this because the government, you know, stepped in and took them over. Um, I have a very large mortgage in my home. No, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. I ask my, when I, when, I, when I speak to a crowd, I ask yeah. people in America, how many of you have bought your home outright, don't have any mortgage? And some people raise their hand. How many of you rent? Some people raise their hand. I say, thank you for subsidizing my mortgage. Sure. I couldn't afford the big house that I have today if I couldn't t deduct the interest I pay on the mortgage for my taxes. You can't deduct your rent. You can't deduct the fact that you bought your home outright. So I'm being subsidized to take on debt. Mm -hmm. right? so, so I take on debt. So, Everything that the U.S. government did was motivated, was driven towards increasing the debt level that people have and driving it towards housing. And that's exactly what happened. And you can look at the time frame. And then, you know, and then banks were told you're too big to fail, so don't worry about the downside. We'll bail you out. So, yeah, they, they, did, they took more risk than shareholders would ever allow them to take in a free market. They did stupid things that they would never do in a free market. So all of this, this crisis from beginning to end, is a crisis of government regulation, government control of the economy. There's not an element of capitalism, not an element of free market in the whole thing, because everything is controlled, everything is regulated. So let's talk about the interest rates for a minute, because you're saying that, uh, in a sense, the Federal Reserve, the government, the collective, through by setting low interest rates, is essentially subsidizing or encouraging everybody to take on debt. Mm -hmm. So, w what is the right interest rate? And what I'm really trying to get out of here, Syria, is, is like, what is the role of the Federal Reserve? What yeah. is the role of the money? Who's going to create the money supply? That's a great question. That's a fundamental question. What is the right interest rate? And, and does anybody think that if you, what is the right price for bread? And, and can anybody imagine if you put 12 guys in a room and give them PhDs in economics, 12 smartest guys in the world, could they come up with the price of bread? Well, they tried this in the Soviet Union, and the answer is no. They'll always either price it too high, which means that a lot of bread will be produced and nobody will want to buy it, or they'll price it too low, which means that nobody will want to produce bread and everybody will want it. That's what happened in the Soviet Union. You got the lines of bread. But we imagine, in our collective wisdom, right, 
that if you put 12 guys in a room and tell them to set the price of interest, mm -hmm. then they'll get it right. Mm -hmm. Interest rates much more complicated a price than bread, mm -hmm. much more important at a price than bread, and yet somehow they'll get it right. They cannot do it. There is no right price of interest rates set by a committee. A committee cannot set that price. No individual can set that price. Only the marketplace. How do we get, when you walk in any supermarket in Canada, there's always bread there. And there's always the bread you want. And it's always at a price you're willing to pay. I mean, that's amazing. And that's what a market of supply and demand and, and, and flexible prices does. Mm -hmm. Well, if we let interest rates have the same thing, then the price of interest rate would be exactly right. But you need a market for that. And to have a market for that, you need the Fed out, okay. which means you, ha you can't have a central bank okay, and get the right price of interest, which means the money is then created by private entities, like financial institutions. Well, how about any company? How about any company or any group of people sure. or any individual, sure. anybody who has any capacity to, to create wealth, let them the create the currency? The, at the end of the day, you'll get one currency uh, it, it denominated in a variety of different forms, but at the end of the day, the logical entities in a free market to create money are banks. And look, uh, before, there was a, before there was a Federal Reserve in the United States, the uh, Federal Reserve is relatively young. The Central mm -hmm. Bank of Canada mm -hmm. is relatively young, even younger than the Federal Reserve. Before that, banks printed money. Each you bank deposit, had their own currency, yes, right? Yes, their own currency. They were all denominated in dollars, mm -hmm. but they had their own currency. And uh, each one of those dollars were exchangeable to gold. And, you know, I don't know in a free market where there would be gold or where there would be you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about Bitcoin or whatever today. Who knows what the currency would be? But the point is the market would set it and interest rates would be determined by the availability of loanable funds, people's savings, and the demand for loans. And where supply and demand intersect, that is the price. And that sets the interest rate. Well, Which is mostly, if every, in the perfect world, in a way, I don't mean perfect, perfect, but okay. in a perfect world, the logistics... I think you're on the lines of William F. Buckley, or am I wrong? Like no, has, William F. Buckley was a huge supporter of the Federal Reserve. This is where oh, he was. You, you oh, mistake conservatives, conservatives oh, with, with uh, Ayn Rand. I, he was. I mean, William F. Buckley, by the way, really hated Ayn Rand. I mean, he kicked her out of the conservative movement oh. purposefully because, because he, he resented the fact that she was an atheist and, and he, was very, he was a devout Catholic. Oh. But William F. Buckley was a statist. He just wanted a small estate. Uh, but he still wanted a welfare state, he still wanted a Federal Reserve, he still wanted government intervention in the economy. We believe in a state, but a very small state, a state that only does one thing. Right. It protects individual rights, it protects you from thieves, from fraudsters, protects you from foreign invasion, and has a court system to arbitrate disputes. But other than that, leaves people alone, you know, leaves the currency alone, leaves interest rates alone, leaves products alone, leaves regulation alone, leaves markets to deal with everything yeah. else other than Force, force is the, is, the monopoly, is the only job of government, is to extract force from society. What do you mean extract it, force from society? It means put the crooks in jail. It means if somebody I initiates see. force, okay. right. take them out, okay. right? Okay. It, it, right? It means be, be there for self-defense, for the purpose of self-defense. I, 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 okay, you still want to talk about security. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, let's talk about a big problem that everybody's talking about these days, sure. and that is the, the, the global environmental crisis. And let's okay. talk about what an Ayn Rand solution would be to that, because other people are talking about global tax okay, schemes. Let me add Jen to that. Let me add Jen to that. So, so you're going to have get, to tell me what this global environmental crisis is, because uh, I look outside and everything looks pretty uh, cool. Well, I, I uh, have to agree let with me add Jen, like, uh, including like in locally, <laughs> let's say the Great Lakes or whatever, the effect of certain factories doing certain things, that, like not not control control, but making sure there's certain pollutions that come out maybe not even have a government involved, some association amongst businesses that they make sure that they sure, follow so, the so right let's thing. start with a certain premise. Yeah. The human environment today, the environment for us, is the best it's ever been in human history. We have never had it better. The air has never been this clean for us, right? Compare this to the, to the, the soot we used to breathe in caves when we used to have fires in caves, mm -hmm. or, the, or in the mud huts we used to live in or in London in the 19th century where there was horse dung all over the street. We have the cleanest air in human history. We have the best water supply in human history. We have the, the highest standard of living. We live longer, we live healthier, we live better. And I'm not just talking about the wealthy, I'm talking about everybody. The poor today, 
live better lives, healthier lives, cleaner lives, have a better environment than the poor have, or anybody has ever lived in human history. So the human environment, we have to start on that assumption, mm -hmm. is better than it's ever been. It's fantastic. <coughs> well, even now, the industrial age in London um, oh, it was, was pretty messy. It was you know, pretty messy, and it's gotten cleaner and cleaner yeah. since then, which is great. Guess, now, yeah. um, so start with that premise. Now, yes, there are problems, right? People are pouring junk maybe into the Great Lakes, or, or, or some companies are, are pouring uh, you know, gases that might be poisonous into the atmosphere. The way to deal with that is through private property. The way to deal with that is, by, is, 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 is through the definition of private property. Why, who owns the Great Lakes? Uh, uh, they are yeah. uh, nobody not does. owned by anybody. <laughs> nobody does. Well, what happens to property that's owned by nobody? Nobody takes care of it. Uh -huh. If it's owned by me, I take care of it. If it's owned by you, you take care of it. How about selling off the Great Lakes or, or having like a homestead act over the Great Lakes and getting, getting private ownership over water? Now, don't ask me exactly how you do it because I, I haven't figured it all out. But there's a way to do it. Like there was a way to do, to do land in the past. If you, own, if you own a piece of the Great Lakes, you're going to make sure it's clean. And if somebody is polluting it, what are you going to do? Can, can you dump your garbage in my backyard? No. We know, we've known that for like a thousand years. Common law has said, you can't drop your garbage in my backyard. Well, if you make my backyard part of the lake, if you make my backyard part of a river or a stream, or, then, you, then you can't pollute it because it's mine. Private property is the solution to pollution. Okay. Now, there's, I, I've, I've read some stuff that says that one way to deal with pollution, especially when it comes to something like the Great Lakes, is that you treat the watershed as um, an entity. In other words, everybody in that water that lives in that watershed is a stakeholder in that watershed. Now, so I'm thinking, I mean, we value democracy in Canada and the U.S. And uh, some people might suggest that, okay, let's, these are all the stakeholders in this watershed. Maybe it's a better idea to, to create a democratic system where the people who are stakeholders in that watershed get to have a say on how that wh watershed they, is managed. Why are they the stakeholders? I mean, the shippers who ship stuff through the Great Lakes are stakeholders. Their livelihood depends on this. The fishermen who go out on there who might not live in the watershed but work on the watershed have a stake in this. Why not find a way to, to give them shares, to give them well, real ownership, and then they can sell them, right? So if I have a house and I get a share in the lake and I can sell it to somebody else and, and create a corporate, some kind of, you know, I don't know. There are all kinds of ways to do this, but it has to be grounded in the idea of private property, otherwise it'll fall apart. If it's, look, democracy is fine when you're voting for a president or when you're voting within a corporate entity for the CEO as a shareholder and so on. Democracy is not good. It's bad. It's evil. When you were voting to violate somebody else's rights, when we were voting to take stuff away from other people, and that's the true nature of democracy historically. This is why the founding fathers of America were so anti-democracy as majority rule, qua majority rule. Think of democracy. My favorite example of democracy is Athens, right? Mm -hmm. Athenian democracy, the first democracy, the pure democracy. Everybody voted on everything. And Socrates, you remember Socrates, the philosopher? He's going around and he's, he's talking to the youth and he's, he's, he's challenging their religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. And the elders of the town say, wait a minute, Socrates is, is corrupting our young people. Right? So let's vote on what we should do with Socrates. Mm -hmm. So they vote. What do they vote? To kill him. Kill him. Because oh, yeah. that's the only way to silence Socrates. There's no other way to silence Pla Socrates. Plato came right after Socrates. Plato right was Socrates' right? student. Oh, okay. And Plato actually tells Socrates, right, they say you have to drink this chalice of poison. And Plato says to Socrates, I might be making this up, but anyway, Plato says to Socrates, I got a tunnel. We can get out of here. And Socrates says, no, I believe in democracy. The people have voted, and he drinks the chalice of poison and dies. Right? Mm -hmm. Do we believe in that kind of democracy, or do we believe, for example, in free speech, and 99% of Canadians can vote to silence me, but no, they can't. And now in Canada, free speech is, mm -hmm. right, some people have been silenced. But in a, I believe, at least, that you cannot silence people. The democracy cannot silence anybody. The same thing as if I own a house, and you want it to turn into a tennis court, and you get all the neighbors to vote to turn it into a tennis court. Does that make it right? Well, here's the thing, though. Once you start to deal with... Uh, any kind of, uh, I'm going to use the word collective, but I don't think I mean it in the sense that, that you were using it earlier. Okay. But when you have uh, an entity, even a corporation, let's say, a private corp, a corporation that's owned by shareholders, yeah. where there's more than one shareholder, yeah. you're going to have 
a difference of opinion inevitably between those shareholders about how to govern that that organization. That's right. So now, so at some point, you're going to have a vote, or you're going to have some system where a, a direction is determined, yes. and some of those owners, some of those shareholders, are are going to get their way, and some aren't going to get That's their right. way. And they have an opportunity to sell their shares in it, and absolutely. So if you could create a corporation over the lake, you'd have to figure out how to distribute those shares initially, how to set it up, and those shares were saleable mm -hmm. and tradable, so that the rights were that you had full right to get in and out. Then absolutely, let's find a way to it to, and that would be a form of privatizing the lake. Let's find a way to privatize the lake to turn all public, so-called public property, into private property, and then it stops being abused because then somebody cares, and then mm -hmm. somebody is there to monitor it because it's theirs. They have economic values at stake. Okay, so. We don't have a lot of time left, but this is a fascinating discussion sure. and certainly blowing yeah. some people's minds, uh, <laughs> sure opening them up to uh, ways that maybe they never really thought about things before. But let's talk about some of the other solutions that, sure. that you've got in your book here and uh, that presumably you're going to be talking about tonight at the U of T. Well, part of the case I make in the book is that capitalism, capitalism works. Uh, it's unequivocal if you look at the historical evidence, if you look at across cultures, if you're talking about creating wealth, creating a higher standard of living, if you're talking about how well the poor do, there is no system in human history that comes even close to capitalism. Every country that approaches a more capitalist system does better than countries that approach a more collectivized system, a more status system, socialism, fascism, whatever. That is just empirical fact. Anybody with eyes should be able to see that. Look at Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. You know, seven and a half million people live on this rock. No natural resources, nothing there. It, Seventy years ago, it was a fishing village. All they have is the protection of property rights. And yet it's thrived. And you'd rather be in Hong Kong than any of the other Asian countries around there. That's why people were willing to go on rafts and row mm -hmm. to try to get to Hong Kong. That's why if they opened the borders, there'd be a flood of millions more people mm -hmm. into that place. So capitalism works. So the question we ask in the book, and this is a question to everybody out there, you know, to me it's, it's self-evident. All you need to do is know history and you know capitalism works. Why do people hate it? Because they do. 90 percent, 90 plus percent of people hate capitalism, particularly in its pure form. Most people think it's a disaster. Most people think all they can think of when they think of capitalism is bad stuff that they learned at school about it. There's nothing positive associated with it. And what am I my claim is that the, our, the problem with capitalism is not economic. The economics are clear cut. They're simple. The, you know, all these economists who claim capitalism doesn't work just don't know what they're talking about. They're lying through their teeth. Paul Krugman's a liar. He's a bad economist and a liar. Paul Krugman? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, um, yeah, he's always on CNN. Yeah, I mean, he's yeah. a, he, he, what he says is just plain false and he, he knows a, it. He just put a book out actually. Yeah, he puts yeah. lots of books out. Yeah. He won the Nobel Prize for <laughs> economics. That's how bad of an economist he is. Um, the problem is that people perceive capitalism as unethical, as immoral, as unjust. It's the ethical beliefs that drive the perception of economics. It's not about economics. It's not about facts. It's not about politics. It's about morality. Because when we grow up from when we're this big, we are taught a particular type of morality. What is good? What is noble? What is virtuous? To a, how, what does our mother tell us is good and noble and virtuous? Putting the interest of others first. Being selfless. Sacrifice. Sacrifice is the greatest virtue of all, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, what's capitalism about? It's about self-interest. Mm -hmm. It's about making money for whom? For you. It's about producing goods for whom? For you. It's about consuming goods for whom? For you. So you've got capitalism that is self-interested and morality that says self-interest is evil. And indeed, what's good is sharing. What's good is sacrifice. What's good is giving to people. Right. You know, so you take Bill Gates. Bill Gates built a wonderful company called Microsoft that touches every human being on the planet, makes all our lives better. And yet he gets zero moral credit for that. When does Bill Gates become a good guy? When he sets up a philanthropy and the starts giving it away. And yeah. how, would he, how would he become a saint? If he gave all his money away and moved into a tent, and if he could bleed a little bit and show a little bit of suffering on the way, then he would become a bigger saint, right? Because saints are sufferers, people who suffer. That's our standard of morality. So now how? Now that's inconsistent with capitalism. That's consistent with socialism. Socialism demands sacrifice. You produce, 
Don't keep it. You have to give it to Joe. Okay, so I'm waiting for the punchline because that's not <laughs> the case here. Because obviously you're very conscientious. No. When you're talking about capitalism. My case is that self-interest is virtuous. That there's absolutely no reason to sacrifice for other people. That selflessness is evil. That it's wrong to be selfless. That it's wrong to sacrifice. That it's wrong to live for other people. You should live for yourself. You should live for your life. You've got one life here. Why should you live it for other people? Okay, so Why do they have a right to your life that's greater than so your life, right to your own right life? But yes. do you find that's a hard sell? Not when explained properly. Okay. Yes, it is when people say, selfish, ooh, because I've got 2,000 years, 2,000 years of philosophy and religion teaching people that thinking about yourself and pursuing your own values and doing what's good for you is evil and wrong. And you should be sacrificing to the state, to God, to your neighbor, to, to, to the poor, to somebody else, that your life is meaningless. And yet people try to live both ways. They try to do what's good for themselves and then they, they do some community service in the, in the evening to make themselves feel good. But I'm saying, what do you need to do the community service to make yourself feel good? As long as you're taking care of yourself, as long as you're doing it in a way that is not hurting other people, that is hurting other people through force. You're not, you're not defrauding them, you're not lying them, you're not cheating, you're not sacrificing them to you. You're not, you're not you know, you're not abusing them, then why do you have to be, you should be proud of your achievements, you should be proud of your own life, you should pursue your own beliefs. That's the story of Howard Walk in the Fountainhead. He's building those buildings for himself. Because, they, because his vision of what is good, his ideals of what is good, he's not doing it for the community, he's not doing it for, uh, for other people, he's doing it for his clients and for himself, for that contractual relationship. And who loses when he does that? When I live for myself, who loses? Everybody gains. The client gains because they got a beautiful building. Mm -hmm. People in the community gain because they can look and see a beautiful building. Who loses? Nobody loses. It's a win-win. The whole beauty of capitalism, the whole beauty of self-interest is they are win-win relationships. We don't, in, you know, we don't do this interview unless I'm benefiting from it and you're benefiting from it. If you're not benefiting from it, you shouldn't do this interview. Please don't do it as a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? There's All human relationships should be like that. Your, your relationship with your spouse should be like that. Your relationship with your kids okay, should be me, like that. Let me rephrase the question. Yes. By following all that you said, which is the Ayn Rand model and work and yeah. so on, does somehow, even while following this mandate that you're, you know, it's for yourself, for the person you're servicing, you know, for the consumer works. Dan, just keep talking. I'll do this. For the people you're trading with. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Keep talking. For, the, yeah. Does it somehow indirectly help community that I'm wondering somehow? Absolutely, it, it helps everybody. Everybody yeah. benefits from this. And, and again, you know, Adam Smith understood this, right? Adam Smith in, in, the, in, in the Wealth of Nations, in 1776, he wrote the book. He says, the baker doesn't bake the bread because he likes you. He doesn't care about you one iota. He's baking the bread because he's trying to make a living. Mm -hmm. And the grocer who sells you the bread doesn't care about you. He's trying to make a living. But you know what? You're better off. And everybody would be better off because the baker bakes the bread. So by people pursuing their own self-interest, not sacrificing, everybody who's willing to work, everybody who's willing to take responsibility over their own life, everybody who's willing to be rational and to pursue their own rational values is better off. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of society that you know, I believe in. That's the kind of society the book is driving towards. That's the kind of society Ayn Rand's driving towards. And to do that, you have to get government out of our lives, out of our lives in every aspect, out of our bedrooms, out of our boardrooms, out of our shops, out of our banks, out of every interaction that we have because they distort that interaction. But to do that, we have to first reject 2,000 years of religion and philosophy, reject the idea that your life doesn't belong to you, reject the idea that, you, that nobility and virtue are sacrifice and giving. Oh. And I say nobility and virtue are building creating, trading, that's what nobility and virtue. I say Bill Gates is a, is a saint, a saint for building Microsoft. The fact that he gives his money away afterwards, eh, fine, who cares? And, he, and, and not only that, but Bill Gates will be, do be, more good for individuals out there in the world through building Microsoft than he ever will through his philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And yet, we live in a society that views his philanthropy as good and building Microsoft as evil. That's why we're in the mess we're in. That's why we're going to get into a bigger mess in the future. We've only just started our mess. And because we're heading to, you know, the society resents individualism. Society resents this idea 
of, uh, of uh, self-interest, and therefore it resents and rejects capitalism. And that's what we're seeing in America today, that's what we're seeing in Europe today, that's what we're seeing all over the world. Dan? That's not taking away anything from your philosophy. Again, I'm just testing on this. Sure, sure. That, uh, that there is, in, in every field, I'm, I'm just using this example in this particular area in the business world, there was corruption in the business, the abuse by people make, cutting up into those little Somebody shares on the mortgages, corrupt. for example. Somebody is corrupt, put them in jail. I yeah, mean, I have nothing right. against that, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But to judge the business world today and say, you see, business is all corrupt no, I wasn't is trying wrong to say, I wasn't trying because to say. you have to also understand the incentive structure. You have to understand what regulations are doing and what government is doing is the role they play. You know, but but mm -hmm. the problem is that in the world we live in, it's so often the case that because you find three corrupt businessmen, we assume that all businessmen are corrupt. Okay. And that's just not true. Yeah, they're corrupt businessmen. They're corrupt doctors. They're corrupt lawyers. A lot of corrupt lawyers. And you know what? The most corrupt field out there is? Media. Politics. <laughs> Politics, okay. Yeah. And media is not far behind. Yeah. Uh -huh. And yet, how many villains, uh, who, who do you think are most of the villains on television, at least in the United States? Over 50% of all the murders committed on television, in fiction, in television, are committed by whom? Businessmen. Mm. You know who commits the fewest murders on, on television in America? Mm. Media people. Mm. Guess why? Because it's the media producing this stuff, right? Mm. Um, but businessmen are perceived to be the most corrupt people in the universe, and yet, well, Jack, the everything around here, everything around here was created by a business. Yeah. These things were dyed with green. Mm -hmm. uh, that was created by some paint company that specializes, that created, that made a profit off of it. These computers are all Samsung, IBM, all businesses. The desks are created by business. This table is Every value that we have around us was created by some guy trying to make a living, trying to make his life better, whether as a, as a, as a big business, a small business, a medium-sized business. This we are, the life we have today, is a testament to business. All the good stuff in the life we have today is a testament to business and, 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 uh, and the profit motive. And yet, we reject it, we resent it, and we want to regulate it, we want to control it, we want to drive them out of existence. I mean, that's just mind-boggling. Well, you're speaking here in, uh, at the U of T tonight, and uh, uh, do you think, uh, do you think, I, I'm, because I'm very convincing, I mean, I'm, I'm buying it, Don't Dan. Don't look at me. Are you buying it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I'm not going to go. I, I totally uh, 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 brought new light on me, and I would uh, really rethink some things, but I'm not going to go all the way with you on that. Read my book. I, I, if, I, if, I, if, I if I could convince you, you if I could I, convince you in 40 minutes of, uh, <laughs> that I was absolutely right, I would worry about you, right? Because uh, yeah. you can't do that. You can't but, do that. But, no. but, but read my book. No, but okay. great respect. Much more respect than on Ayn Rand than I did. Okay. All right, so here's the book, uh, Free Market Revolution, uh, How Ayn Rand's Ideas Can End Big Government, and you're at the U of T tonight. Uh, I've got oh, the yeah. info, uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, the Medical Sciences Building, One King's College Circle, room 3153. So uh, people can check that out tonight. I think it's uh, 715, the door's open. 715, the door's open, and can you put the information up on the website? Yeah, we will. That'd be we'll, good. we'll do that. And That'd where are you going next after? Uh, doing some more media this afternoon, and yeah. then uh, heading towards a talk, and then I head uh, to Chicago. Okay. And continue on my. Uh, well, well, great. Thanks for coming in today and having my this pleasure. conversation. My pleasure. Thanks for doing this. Okay. okay. Thanks. Well, we're gonna.